Monday morning. Here we go. <laughs> All right, everybody. So, sorry about that. Good morning. Good to see you bright and early on this Monday morning. Um, so, we have a, I have a little phylogenetic trivia for you. I don't know if you noticed it without the projector going. Um, but we'll talk about this in a second. Before I forget, though, let me briefly uh, just tell you that um, so there's, there's one, one observer in the class today who's just, uh, you, may, you may notice somebody taking pictures with a cell phone, and it's just uh, the college is sort of um, tabulating the instructional methods that are used in different classes, so, it's a, so that's basically what it's about. So anyway, I don't think it'll bother you much. Um, so so my, I thought I would start out with some phylogenetic trivia. Um, and, and the first one is this question, so there are, there are two million described species um, in the world. So basically, science has described two million species. There's probably way more than that. Um, sort of, it depends a little bit on how you define species and things like bacteria. Um, but there's a lot. And 25% of the ones that have actually been described are one of these three groups. And you might be forgiven for thinking that it would be something big sounding like plants or bacteria, in fact, the answer is beetles. 25% um, of, of known species are beetles. And um, so that, that brings me to uh, a story about somebody named JBS Haldane, um, uh, which, which I will get to, get to in a second. So there's a sort of a, uh, a funny quote by this fellow, um, maybe, maybe apocryphal. Um, but anyway, we attribute it to him. So but I'll, but I'll say something about him before I before I get to that. So he's, um, he's actually one of the founders of kind of the quantitative population genetics. So the stuff that we were doing in the first part of the course, we touched a little bit on some of that stuff. Um, he's, he was a 20th century mathematical biologist and was involved in you know, also developing equations for describing um, enzyme kinetics, actually. Um, so he had, you know, is kind of an important person, has, has a number of um, things that he's involved in, a number of important contributions. Um, and so there is this story about him that, uh, that, you know, supposedly some religious figures approached him and said, what can you tell about the creator based on his creation? And supposedly Haldane's response was an inordinate fondness for beetles. Um, which I don't, I'm not sure I really believe it because he was, because he was, he was like, he was a communist, like he was a hardcore atheist. So I'm not sure they would have approached him. It's just hard to imagine that happening. But anyway, um, so. So anyway, the answer to the first phylogenetic trivia question is beetles. Um, and this phylogenetic tree here um, tells us that the answer to the other three trivia questions that I had are, is all human. So um, the number two was, what's more closely re related to a chimp, a gorilla, or a human? And so we can see from this tree that human and chimpanzee form a clade with gorilla outside that meaning that what's closer to a chimpanzee, actually a human is closer to a chimpanzee than a gorilla is. Um, and you know, what's closer to a lizard, a salamander, or a human? Well, again, lizards and humans are, are inside a clade here defined by this, um, this internal node. This is actually has a name. It's the amniote clade. So it's basically all, all kind of land animals, land tetrapods, not including um, amphibians. And so humans are actually closer to lizards than salamanders are. Um, and then the last one, what's closer to a dinosaur, a frog, or a human? And again, that amniote clade, dinosaurs and humans are both part of it. So humans are actually closer. Which is funny if you think about, if you remember um, Jurassic Park, right? The story, what, what they were doing there, they, they had sort of fragmentary dinosaur DNA that they had recovered, but it wasn't enough you know, to, to make a dinosaur. So they needed to fill in the gaps with something. And in the story, they fill in the gaps with frog DNA. So this tree shows you sort of how silly that is. You'd actually have been better off filling it in with human DNA, or even better bird DNA. But anyway, all right. So, so my plan for today um, is to talk a little bit about coevolution um, between uh, hosts and pathogens, and then uh, talk about representing trees in Python, and then we're going to start talking about phylogenetic reconstruction. So we'll take the first pass. That problem. Um, so, so just to remind you, uh, we have sort of a problem that we're working on right now 
is we have a tree you know, uh, giving us the relationships of the host of the you know host species in this case primates for HIV SIV viruses and you know we're wondering well each of these is infected by by an immunodeficiency virus and so we're wondering sort of what is the relationship between um, the tree that we could make for the pathogens, the immunodeficiency viruses, and the tree for this host. I see a couple of people with open laptops. I see three. I would request that all of you please close those. Thank you. So, so that's sort of what we're about, is we're trying to figure out how can we relate uh, the host tree to a pathogen tree. And so, so we're going to be sort of getting to the phylogenetic reconstruction part because we need to build the pathogen tree and we'll be doing that on the homework. But what, what I want to talk about first is sort of how you can, how you can relate those, the host and pathogen tree. So the problem is sort of the, a problem that we'll come to later. So let's consider um, the evolution of you know, some host species that's infected by say a virus, some pathogen, maybe a virus. And so I'm going to represent the host phylogeny in orange and the pathogen is the sort of dashed blue lines here. So this host had a, had a common ancestor and it's, you know, it's had, you know, over evolution, it's diverged into a few different species represented by this tree. And the ancestor was infected by a particular strain of the pathogen. And during the course of that evolution, of the host's evolution, the pathogen has also been sort of with the host the whole time. And so every time there's a speciation event in the host, there's also a speciation event in the pathogen that's in, infecting it. And so we end up with a pathogen tree that has kind of the same shape as the host tree. So we would call this co-evolution. So it's a particular scenario for how hosts and pathogens could evolve together. And so uh, there's an example um, from primates that we can find of a, of a situation like this. There's something called the, the simian foamy viruses, which are, um, there's actually not a uh, sort of native version for humans at this point, but other non-human primates do have versions of these viruses. They cause very mild infections. It's a retrovirus, so it's similar to HIV in that sense, but in, in the primates that, are, that it's infecting, it causes typically a very mild infection, maybe not even sort of noticeable. Um, you, you may know that there are, there are viruses like that, right? You've got some, you've probably got some right now where you're infected by something and you have no idea because the symptoms are so mild or even not, not noticeable at all. So that's the case with these viruses. Uh, and so over here, we're representing sort of host tree uh, for, for apes and then the, uh, the pathogen tree and I sort of dashed lines indicating what, what pathogen infects what host, right? So there's a, a group of, on this pathogen tree that all infects the chimpanzee. Um, there's a couple that infect the gorilla and so on. And so you can see, looking at this, that the pathogen tree, the divergences, correspond very nicely to, to what's happening in the host tree as well. And so we could um, draw a version of the pathogen tree, now I'm doing that in dashed lines here, indicating sort of where, how the pathogen you know, speciation events correspond to the host, like so, right? And so the only thing is that on this model, so that the, the pathogen tree is following the host tree everywhere except along the human branch, where we infer that there was a loss. So the idea is that in our ancestry, we did have ancestors who were infected by these viruses, but, but the human-specific virus got lost at some point in our evolution, and so it's no longer, it's no longer present in the human population. Humans do get these sometimes, but they get them invariably. It's from one of the other species. It's from exposure to some other species, and, you, and you'll find a human who's gotten infected by like the chimpanzee version of it. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't even know they existed, right? Like the only reason something like this comes to our attention is because um, because of some human health issue. Okay, so so this is an example of what I, what I could say kind of pure coevolution. So there, there's no there's no kind of transfer events in this story. It's all just divergences and the pathogen following the host. So, so here's a different scenario. So here we've got host and pathogen. I've drawn lines between them. And, and it's kind of crazy and confusing. And so you've got closely related you know, host species that are infected by distantly related pathogens. Or you, you know, you've got you're even the same host infected by distantly related pathogens. You've got distant, distantly related pathogens who are infecting the same host. And you know, so it's, it's all kind of confusing. And it's hard. Um, it would be hard to take this tree and sort of place it on the orange host tree in a logical and easy to understand way, right? There would it'd be complicated if you're going to try and figure out exactly what happened. 
so there's no sort of very clear story of co-evolution here. Um, and so that this kind of thing happens if host switches happen easily, um, for example, and it could also be the case if there's just a virus that can infect lots of different species. Which can happen. And actually, rabies is an example of that latter thing. So, rabies is a virus, right, which I'm sure you're familiar with. It infects mammals, it causes, um, infects the brain, so it causes behavioral problems. And um, it actually, the same virus can infect many different mammal species. And so, this is just a map showing sort of around the world what are you sort of in any given region most likely to get rabies from? Like, when people get rabies, what, what is the species that's passing it to them? And it varies around the world. But it's the same virus, actually, um, and so and so that's a sort of that kind of a virus. Like you, you wouldn't be able to have any sort of you know nice coevolutionary story. Okay, so um, another thing, another thing to say is that sometimes we we may have additional information about um, about the, the coevolutionary story. So, for example, there could be constraints on which way the pathogen is passed. So. You know, for example, it's, it's pretty common that um, a pathogen could be passed from prey to its predator, but not so common that it could be passed the other way. And just because the predator is eating the prey, it gets exposed to blood and tissues and all kinds of other things, but that doesn't ever happen in reverse. The prey's dead whenever it gets exposed to the predator, right? So that's actually the case with HIV. So, so HIV is basically thought to go from non-human primates to humans. And the reason is humans eat on human primates, like eating bush meat, basically. Um, so that, that's a kind of probably the big exposure for humans. Um, and so that's one thing that we may sometimes know, kind of additional bits of information that could be useful in figuring out the coevolutionary scenario. And another thing is we may know something about the relative timing. So for example, it's often the case that the evolution of a pathogen has happened in a very short amount of time. You may know that. You may know that the like, last common ancestor of the pathogen tree like actually didn't, you know, lived very recently. And so that's an additional kind of consideration that you can use in trying to figure out what's happened when you're relating these two things. Okay, so, so I want to um, talk about a different, uh, one way, that sort of useful way of thinking about, um, of looking at this scenario as you're trying to figure out what happened when you've got a host tree and a pathogen tree. And so, that is to look at the, you sort of basically you kind of look at the pathogen tree and then you think about the host that it's in as being a character trait or a state. So if you remember in recitation, the early like the first recitation that we had, we were looking at we talked about this a little bit, mapping traits like uses milk to feed the young onto a tree. And so here we could we could have the, the trait, you know, is in host A or is in host B and map that onto the pathogen tree is the idea. So, so here I have a scenario with host species, two hosts, um, A and B, simple tree, and then some pathogens that infect them, and, and the dashed lines are indicating what's infecting what. And so one, one thing that we know in, in my scenario here is that the pathogen tree uh, evolution there happened relatively quickly, so that the last common ancestor of a pathogen very recent and lived in, you know, basically what that tells you is that the last common ancestor of the pathogen actually existed in one of these host species. A or B, right? So if, if the pathogen has evolved very, very quickly compared to the host, the common ancestor of it actually, you know, didn't live that long ago, and so it was basically either it was in species A or species B. Okay, so so to represent, so we want to figure out what's the what's the possible scenario for for this example that I've just shown you. So so we can do that. I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of show you. Um, Representing it as a character trait. So, so, and there's two there's two possible explanations, right? Either either it started out in species A, or it started out in species B. So I'll start out with the with the case of it. We're imagining that it was in species B. So in that case, it could be that the pathogen tree had an had an early divergence inside species B, and one of those branches stayed there, and then the other branch goes along and has another divergence. One of those branches stays in, in host B, and the other one actually transfers up to A. So that's sort of one. That's the that's the most parsimonious scenario if it began in host B. And so then the kind of character state way of representing that would look like this. Here's the pathogen tree, and so I'm imagining that it's in host B, 
So then there's a, you know, a branching off on this pathogen tree, and it just stays in host B all the way here, and so this one ends up in host B. Okay? And then along here, we're still in host B, and then another branching, this one goes, ends up in host B. And then along this branch, though, we have a change in state from host A to host, or from host B to host A. So this is kind of a sort of simpler way of representing that scenario, right? And so then we can look at the other scenario where now we imagine that we're starting at host A in this situation, and then we're going to have to have a change to host B along two branches, right, along each of these branches, because each of those branches of the pathogen tree are ending up, ending up in host B. Okay, and so between these two scenarios, this has got two changes, right, so we would prefer the one that begins in host in host B, which only has one change required. And so that, I think that's a pretty relatively sort of simpler way of thinking about these things. OK, so I'd like to ask you to do the worksheet activity now. Um, and so we've got a host tree with three species, a pathogen tree. And we know a few things about the situation in terms of how transmission can go. So we're imagining that maybe B is like a predator. So A can go to B. You could transfer, you could transfer from host A to host B, or you could transfer from host C to host B, but not, not vice versa. So sort of once it's once once it's in B, it can't get out, kind of thing. And then you could also have transfers from A to A to C. And we want to know, sort of thinking about you know, try and figure out what's the most parsimonious scenario. So in that case, how many transmission events would you expect to see from A to B and from C to B?
right? So, um, so a good way to think about this is that sort of state type approach that I was talking about a second ago. Um, so, so we're going to sort of look at the pathogen tree, and we're going to, you know, imagine there, there's some starting state, and then we're just going to run through and think about how the state needs to change in order to get it so that everything is in the right state by the time you get to the tip that, you know, so that the state would correspond to what the tip is actually, what host it's actually in, which is indicated by the dashed line here. So, so one thing is that once, once you go into state B, you can't get out, right? So that would say, don't start in state B. You can't start in state B. So we're going to start in something else down here. It actually does, turns out not to matter whether you, you imagine it A or C. It could go either way. I'll just do it A. Um, so I'm imagining that I'm starting in state A here. So we could trace along this branch in state A, and very nicely this ends up you know, in state A here, and same along this branch. Along here, this one's in B, so we're going to have to have a host transfer event to B right there, A to B, one A to B event there. Right. So, so that's actually the answer for the, for the first one. So as I said, we're starting in C here. Or, sorry, we're starting in A here, I said. And so notice that down here, everything's either in B or C. So, so we would have a change from A to C along, at this point, along this branch. So basically, we want to be in C by the time we get here. And so then, you know, going along these branches, well, C gets inherited there, and then we have both of these in B, what that means is you can have a single transfer from C to B right here on, along this branch, and it would account for both of those. So that's one. And then down here, we have both of these are in C, so that's fine. We were in C here. When we get on this one, again, we're going to have to change the B. So that's another C to B change. So there'd be two there. Questions about that? Yes. A to B. C to B is two. Ah, uh, you mean like this right here? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so where we were at was there's this. We were imagining there's a C in this ancestor. It's in state C. And, and, that, and that makes sense. You know you want it to be C by here because all you've got is B and C here. And it shouldn't be B because once you're in B, you can't get out. So it really needs to be C. So, so we're imagining it's C along this branch. And this, it gets inherited to C right there. So that's, that's fine. These two are both B. So, so you might think, well, it should be two events because there are these two, right? But in fact, you could actually just have a change on this branch change from C to B along this branch, then it's B at this ancestral point and both inherit B. So you can do it with just one change. Yes? Yeah, so, so that's, that's right. So we're, so we're, so, so we're um, are we using the structure of the host tree? I think the answer, the answer is, is not. In the, in a, so it's a simplification in some way. That's right. So, so there are for this kind of problem, this host, this host, um, host pathogen reconciliation problem. Like, definitely, you can use the the shape of the of both trees, and and that is like an algorithmic problem that, that people are, are concerned with. In fact, um, yeah, it's uh, so that's a good insight. Yes. I may not be um, getting your question, but 
Yeah, I mean, we're imagining that it's in host A. We actually, you could look at either scenario. You could have done it. You could have also imagined that it was in C. And if you did, then you would have had to change C to A along this branch. And, but you would have ended up with the same answers. So it, it didn't matter from that perspective. But yeah, we're imagining, we, we kind of try different scenarios. We imagine it's in A or we imagine it's in C. And we figure out what's the sort of most parsimonious what's the least number of changes we can get starting in that way, and then we try it another way and see what's the least number of changes we can get that way, and we sort of pick among all those what's the, what's the least. All right, so let me, let me uh, push on a little bit in the interest of time. Um, so, the, so the next thing, so we're going to be, uh, for the homework due next week, you're going to be implementing a phylogenetic reconstruction algorithm called neighbor joining. Um, so you're going to be taking uh, distance matrix data, which is sort of basically what you're producing this week, and you're going to be using that to make a phylogenetic reconstruction of the, of the HIV, SIV strains, pathogen strains. So your algorithm, of course, is going to need a way of representing uh, a phylogenetic tree in Python, and so that's what we're going to talk about now. Um, so our, our format, the sort of Bio52 phylogenetic format is a four tuple tree um, and so it consists it's a tuple and it consists of four elements length of four the first thing is the node name so that would be something like on a tip it's the species name or if it's an internal node if that has a name it's got it's got that then sort of trees are right they're kind of naturally recursive nested structures so actually the way the way this representation works is it's got a left subtree and a right subtree into it, and those are actually themselves four tuple trees. All right. So and I'll, sh I'll show that in a second, but that's what these are. These are just four tuple trees representing the left and the right subtrees of it. And then the fourth element is the branch length of the branch leading to the node that we're considering. Because we're going to be we're going to be interested in neighbor joining and, and knowing how long the branches are. We'll say more about that in a second. Okay, so let me so let me take this uh, take this tree as an example. So so this tree, um, I'm going to sort of start building up the four tuple representation for this tree that I've got here. So the node I start out with the with the root node, the outermost node. Its name is A, so that goes in the name position. Now it it's the it's the root node. So we imagine that there's a sort of a zero length edge leading to it, just for sort of bookkeeping. Um, so I put a length zero in my branch length, and now I've got these two subtrees, the left and the right subtree. And so let me so let me go through those. So the right subtree in this case is actually a branch leading to the tip Y, right? And so I'll represent that. So I've just put that into my four tuple representation. It's got name Y. It's got a branch length of five. That's the length of this branch. And then it has empty tuples for the left and right subtrees. So that's the way a tip looks. A leaf or a tip, we call it, you know, representing a living species, is it has empty tuples for the left and right subtrees. Right? And okay, and so so that's the right subtree of this of this outer you know tree of with the root name A. And then we want to look at the left subtree, and that's a little bit more involved. So the left subtree has a name B, it has a branch length of two. So there's the two, right? So this is the zeroth element and the third element. And then we have, again, a left subtree and a right subtree. The right subtree is the tip W. So there it is, tip W, empty tuples for left and right subtrees, branch length three. And then a left subtree, which is called C, and it has a branch length of one, and it has X and Z itself as left and right subtrees. Right? So that's how sort of nested representation of this works. Um, and we'll, in, a, in just a bit, we're going to start talking about kind of algorithms for building these things, given, given the data. All right. so, so let me, having, having given you that um, brief run through, let me have you consider this tree right here and actually just take a moment and draw it, draw it out in your notes based on the four tuple representation there.
So here's what the tree looks like. So if you were starting to draw it, probably starting with the tip would be a bad way to do it, with a, you know, the tip somewhere. So camel and whale or equade, um, they each have a branch length of one. So you could draw that with a branch length of one. Uh, that clade is called F. It has a branch of length one leading to it. And then the other thing going along uh, with that is, um, is this human branch, right? Which is uh, got a length of two. Together, F and the human branch are in a, a clade called E, um, which has got a branch of length three leading to it. And then on the other side, we have elephant and anteater, each with branches of length two leading to them. That's a, a node called G, with again with a branch of length three leading to it coming from the from the root node. So it's also kind of a interesting phylogeny, right? Like humans are uh, closer to whales than they are to elephants. Interesting. Um, okay. Any any questions about the trees? One thing I'll say is that up till now I've been showing trees with named internal nodes. We actually typically don't do that as there's really no, no reason to and you often, you know, there's some inferred ancestor. So uh, in our trees for the most part we're going to have, instead of having named internal nodes like this, we'll, we will just, for all the internal nodes, we'll just give it, you know, the, the string ANC for ancestor um, and only the tips will actually have names. Um, okay, so, so now I want to uh, take, take a pass at the phylogenetic reconstruction problem. Um, and, and to remind you uh, sort of where we are, I showed you this last week as, a, as a kind of our agenda for a few weeks. And so we were, in last week, we were talking about sort of what is sequence alignment, and we went through the Jukes Cantor correction. And all that was basically about building a matrix of distances, which is what you're doing on the homework um, due tonight. And so that, all of it, is input for the phylogenetic reconstruction algorithms that we're going to talk about this week. Um, and so we're going to, now going to start talking about the neighbor joining algorithm. Today, I'm going to, I'm going to do a simplified version of it, sort of a first pass, and then we'll come back next time and fix a few things um, so, that it, so that it works, um, works best. So let me, let me just say one thing, that up until now, the We've typically been imagining when we look at a phylogenetic tree, we've been kind of imagining either, you know, implicitly often that that the branch, the lengths of the branches correspond to time. And that's that's fine, that's often the case when somebody makes a tree, that is often what they're representing. Um, but it's also the case that very often you're representing something else with branch lengths. And and a very common thing is to represent genetic genetic distance some kind of measure of genetic changes. And so for the trees that we're going to be making, like the output of the neighbor joining algorithm, those trees will have, um, the branch lengths will be substitutions per site. So you can have it be number of substitutions or, or substitutions per site. And so that's, that's what the trees that we're going to be producing have. And so one of the things about when you do that is if you, if you do it with time and, you're, and sort of all the species that you're representing in the tree are living species, all the tips, then it all comes to the same level, of course, because it all has to come to the present. But if you're talking about something with, you know, where genetic distances are on the branches, you can get trees like this, where some of the branches sort of extend out farther than others. Um, any thought as to why, like, why that would be? Why is it that, that this branch can end up being longer and this tip is sort of farther in this direction than this one? Yeah. Less substitutions, exactly. So, and, and kind of underlying that is it could be that the like selection is acting differently on the branches, or uh, the or maybe actually the mutation rate is different. That's also possible. So that could be the sort of cause of the fact that there's just less genetic distance between this sort of species on the tip and the root versus this one on the root. Okay. 
Um, okay, so 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 let me take now take a pass at this um, sort of first pass at at neighbor joining. I'll call this today's version simple neighbor, and it's going to be wrong in a few ways, or it's going to do things in a not ideal way. Um, but we'll start with this, and then we'll come back next time. So the input for the algorithm is a distance matrix. Um, so I have my distance matrix here. Uh, it sort of looks like I'm representing it in substitutions. As I was, as you you know know from the homework, hopefully what you're going to be actually having is substitutions per site, so just divided by the number of sites. And so what we want to do is we want to produce a tree that corresponds to this matrix. So here's a tree that that, that happens to correspond to this particular matrix. And so you know, ideally what we mean by correspond is also the branch lengths correspond to the values in the matrix. So for example, if you take say A and B in the matrix, they have a distance of six between them. And if in this tree, if you add up the branches between A and B, you know, three plus one plus two, you end up with six as well. And so this particular tree corresponds exactly to the matrix in terms of those distances. So that's sort of the ideal case that you could reconstruct a, a tree that would correspond perfectly. With real data, it's, it's noisy, so it's never possible to get it exactly perfect. Um, but actually, the HIV data that we're working with is pretty good in this respect. It's possible to make trees that correspond pretty well to, to the matrix data, and, and neighbor joining is actually very good at that. Okay, so let me first give you a high, like a high-level overview of how these algorithms work. So, the basic idea is an, it's an iterative algorithm where we build up a tree step by step from the matrix. And so the idea is that, so we start out with a matrix, we find um, the two, you know, two species in the matrix that we're going to sort of build into our tree first, we're going to merge, we'll say, we pick them um, based on some criteria, which we'll talk about. And so, you know, in this case, um, I've picked X and, X and Z. And so now I'm going to start building up a tree from, from X and Z. And so the idea then is that this sort of X and Z unit now becomes a species in the matrix. And we actually add that to the matrix, and we remove the independent X entries and the independent Z entries. So that our sort of new matrix, after we've done that, it contains this merged X and Z, but no independent X and Z entries in it. And so, so now we're sort of treating this thing as, as a species, or as you know, completely equivalent to the sort of species that we started out with. And so then we can iterate again. So then we find you know, the, the two that we want to merge again, pick another two, right? So it's, now we're going to merge this X and Z with W. So we put those together into it. We're sort of building up a tree. And we're going to delete the independent entries for each of these. And, and add in an entry for that newly merged node, and so on. And when we get down to having only two things left in the, in the matrix, we're done. We can stop that iterative process, and then we can just merge those last two things, is the idea. Okay? So that's the big picture. And um, so let's talk a little bit about the first thing, which is picking nodes to merge. So, so for now, we're going to do a simple thing, which is we're just gonna we're gonna follow the idea that basically things that are more closely related should have less dif distances differences between them. And so we're just gonna today we're just gonna pick the two things that are closest, and that'll be the every time that'll be what we choose to merge. That's actually not quite right. Um, that's not quite the right way to do it. And we'll talk about that next time. But for now we'll just do this. And so all right. So let's so let's go ahead and do that. So I'm I've got I'm gonna step through the algorithm. I've got a distance matrix. I've got a node list. So this is just a list of sort of the active nodes. And as I merge things, I'll be removing them from the node list and adding the newly merged nodes to that. And it's sort of where I keep track of where I'm at, as it were. OK, so in this matrix, I'm going to pick the two closest things to merge. And as I said, that's what we're doing today, but that's actually not, that's not quite right. And we'll refine that with neighbor joining next time. So for now, um, I pick x and z. They're separated by only two. I'm going to make a new node with x and z. And I need to figure out how to, you know, how, about, how long to make those branches. And again, we're going to do something simple today, which we'll refine next time, which is there's a distance of two between them, but we're just going to cut it in half and put one on you know, one side and one on the other. So it was two, so we cut that in half. So, so that's what we've got. So that's our new node. Now we need to make a Python representation of this. And so the Python representation, remember it's a four tuple tree, and 
we've just created an internal node. You remember I mentioned we're not going to be naming those. So I'm going to make the name just be the string A and C. Then I've got a left subtree and a right subtree, which is X and Z. So X and then Z. So notice, like I took X and Z out of this list. Now in the node list, they're tips and they're, they're listed with a branch length of zero leading to them, right? So we're going to change that because we've now decided that the branch length should be one. So we have X and it's a tip, so it's got a, two empty tuples for the left and right subtrees and then this length of one. And same thing for Z. And then we don't know about, we haven't yet decided about the length of the branch leading to this thing. So I'm going to put a zero in the branch length position, position for this. All right. So the next thing is, so I created that node. The next thing is I need to update the matrix, right? So I need to get the distances for this new node to, to other things. And so that's what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to be sort of going through how you can, so we've got this X and Z node, and we want to know how far is it to other other species that are in this matrix. And so for example, Y is one of the other ones. And so, so you, you can just conceptually imagine, right, there's going to be some tree, there's an underlying tree that we're trying to reconstruct, right? And that's got Y in it somewhere outside of X and Z. And so there's other stuff in there too, but we don't, we won't worry about that. So just, just think about the fact that there's some path represented by these dashed lines between this newly merged node and Y. To get the length of those branches, we can, we can do the following. We can take the distance from x to y, which I'm representing in red, and we can take the distance from z to y, which I'm representing in blue, right? And these distances are coming out of the, going to come out of the matrix. We've got a distance matrix. It's got those values. So we add those two together. Then we're going to subtract the distance from x to z, which is yellow here. So that's sort of what we've got left is sort of two passes over this da dashed line that we're going to just divide by two. And that gives us an estimate of how long that part is. And so that's sort of the distance from this newly merged node, an estimate of the distance from this newly merged node to y. So we can go ahead and do that for both y and w, because those are the two, other, the two other species that are in this matrix. We get those estimates, we put them in the matrix, we get rid of the independent, X and, uh, independent entries for X and for Z, and we have our new matrix. And then we want to add this to the node list. So this is the newly merged node that I created a moment ago. I add it to the node list, I take, take out the independent entries for X and Z, and now I'm ready to go, ready to go to the next step. So now we iterate again. So, all right, here's my distance matrix. Again, today I'm picking the two closest things, which happens to be a four. So that's the distance from Y to W. I'm gonna start building that up. I will divide that distance of four in half, put two on each branch. So I start to make this new node for W and Y. And construct that in Python, right? Here it is, ank, left tree with W, right tree with Y. I put the distance of two in those, and then we have a currently a branch length of zero leading to this, because we haven't figured that, out, that part out yet. We need to update the, update the distance matrix. So now we're, we're going to calculate the distance of this newly merged Y and W to already existing nodes that were already in the matrix. One of those is the X and Z one that we had made before. And so here, it's the distance of Y to X and Z plus the distance of W to X and Z, right? minus the distance from y to w, all over 2, and that gives us an estimate of this distance. We put that in the matrix. So now we've reduced it down. Notice we've got a matrix, and we removed those independent entries. We've got it down to um, just two things remaining. And so at that point, we're done um, with the sort of iterative process, and we just need to join those last two nodes together. Right here I've, here, I've added the new node to the node list. And for the final step, the termination step, I'm just taking that distance of 6 and splitting it in half to join the, join the last two. And then finally, I want to create the final tree, which has an ank, and, and then those two nodes, each with a branch length of 3. Um, and then the final tree, of course, also has a branch. There's no branch leading to it, right? That's the sort of, it's a zero um, for bookkeeping. All right. So, all right, so I will leave it there. It looks like I managed to make it on time. Um, I hope you all have a good day, and I'll see you on Wednesday. It's a billion office hours this afternoon.